It looks like we're live, and we're going to kick it off with our first presenter today. He is presenting live, and so he's going to be joining you after the talk in our Discord. If you have any questions in Twitch, we'll try to forward all those questions over to Discord. Uh, make sure you're in Discord. Your depth on Discord is really cool. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff in there from CTFs to hands-on hacking labs. There's, you know, the only limit is our bandwidth. So if you bring down our CTF or bring down our labs, um, it means that we're really popular, but it also means that, you know, we have a lot going on. So we want to make sure that everything is going well. I'm just sort of vamping a little bit while you all get into the room and see, we can see our Twitch stream going up. Let's see, people are asking, when is it going to start? Awesome. You already have a lot of people in the Twitch stream, Barack. It's going to be so cool. So yeah, our first talk is titled Hacking Smart Devices for Fun and Profit from Exploiting My Smart Home into Controlling Thousands of Smart Devices Around the World. Um, and we have our researcher here presenting their research, Barack Sternberg, security researcher at Sentinel Labs. And with that, take it away, Barack. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sam. Um, well, I really, really appreciate and grateful for being here. So thank you a lot for uh, DEF CON, for DEF CON IoT Village, Sentinel One, and everyone that support me along the way. Uh, we'll speak about it also soon. Uh, let's start with uh, the title. So Hacking Smart Devices for Fun and Profit. This is a true and genuine story about me uh, trying from exploiting my smart home into co gaining control of a thousand of smart devices in the entire world. So let's start. So first about me, um, my name is Barack Sternberg, I also live in Beef in Twitter, so make sure to follow. I'm a security researcher and also an author in Sentinel-1 Labs. Um, I have a master's on algo in computer science on algorithms. And one of the favorite things I'll have to mention is that I'm also a party lover and a DJ. So you can make sure you follow my Mixcloud on, uh, on, to see my set and stuff. But uh, besides falling out party, which is not so relevant in the Corona period, um, I love to focus on vulnerability research. Um, I love computer security. I'm enthusiastic about network security, IoT, embedded devices, uh, Linux, web apps, and more and more. And also to analyze in malwares in the wild. I'm a CTF player, and I love a good game of uh, hacking uh, any kind of devices. So with this in mind, uh, let's start. So. Starting uh, this project uh, goes quite well, well, way back. And when I say way back, I mean really back, 2010. Uh, what happened in 2010? So first, uh, we are renovating our family home. We are fixing all this home. The second most important thing was uh, the Walking Dead first season was just came in up. Uh, the first season, just to keep in mind, today it's the 10th season already, I think, of The Walking Dead, and it's keep counting, amazing series, much watched, must watch one. And, well, we installed smart home devices, which were the Philips Dynalite. And the Philips Dynalite have software and apps, but they were really, really expensive. Uh, back then it was really uh, high extras, and we didn't bother it, just the technician came, installed these softwares uh, and apps to itself uh, to configure uh, all of our devices, all of our smart home systems. And from there on, uh, we didn't have anything to control it. So you can say it's a smart home device, but not quite really. And so we don't have any remote app control. And usually in these scenarios, we, we can think about ourselves as, uh, well, our own uh, technicians that can do it by ourselves, right? So why not do it ourselves? So this scary diagrams is not that scary. What you see here is actually um, the Philips Dynalite controllers that control my smart home devices in my, in my parents' home. The, this actually been the controllers themselves. So as you can see here, this one is the full electricity diagram downloaded freely from the Philips uh, site. Uh, and the interesting thing you can observe here is that, well, each controller controls something, controls specific maybe lights, have specific capabilities and attributes. So this electricity diagram have on this side um, the channels, which are directly connected usually to the relays, to uh, to the dimmers, to the buttons, to, uh, to anything, uh, for example, they 
this channel, channel one, have powered out electricity to your light, your light bulb, or maybe to a window, or maybe to a large light system, or anything else. So this is on these sides, and this is how the relay is the switch on and off stuff. And they, on the other side, they are connected, as you can see here, the microprocessor. This is the microprocessor, and this microprocessor is very cool because it's the uh, the thing that connects between the uh, the electricity circuits here and the serial, which is here. So on the on its other end, there is a serial output, which you can obviously understand. It might be the the controlling area. So when I connect to these devices to configure them, I usually use this serial interface, and this use something that's called Dynet protocol of the uh, Dynalite, Dynalite uh, Philips systems, and it's really cool. It's connected by RS uh, four five uh, four eight five. Uh, which is really, uh, it's not that unique in a sense that many industrial systems are actually using this kind of type of serials mm -hmm. uh, compared to the usual serial RS2322. Uh, two, uh, two, two. Um, and also what you can understand is that this serial is connected to this building block, which is, what is that? So this is, uh, I bought actually an IP serial adapter and this is a cool serial adapter that is used to uh, uh, connect all up between the serial and the IP. And I am sitting here gently and trying to uh, to wait for something to happen, right? For, uh, sending commands, maybe seeing something, I don't know. So what happened next is that I tried to send calls to these controllers. I'm sending calls to these controllers and nothing happened. Nothing. I use this wonderful GitHub repo, which is not complete. It has some several API documentations of Dynet No. 1, but it's not exactly the Dynet I needed. Mm, it's really weird. And also uh, the packets. So I, I could have observed the type of the packets, the type of the packets uh, used to be sent to Dynet. The packets usually are in the structure of sync number and area code a command type and some extra data to navigate and uh, to navigate between the different possibilities. For example, I want uh, the light to be in 100 percent or 50 percent uh, um, uh, percentage of, uh, of light. Uh, so I can put this stuff in the extra data uh, area, which is right here. So this is a, a packet used to be sent over a serial connection, as I seen before, as we have seen before. And this is really cool. So I start sending packets, nothing happens. And I remember me and my father are sitting in the saloon and like, mm, why not send in all the packets? And when I mean all the packets, let's just send, let's just fast the system, right? What could happen, right? Sending all opcodes to the controllers could be an amazing thing to do, no? Uh, really all, like in 4i in X range uh, 256. And it wasn't a surprise that, um, um, yeah, uh, maybe you laugh right now, but it's actually a real thing. It's a house that people live in that went crazy. So we send all of these commands and all of a sudden, I remember myself sitting in the kitchen and all the lights are flipping crazy, windows turning on and off at the same time and we don't know what is happening. And well, try to remember which command you send in this fuzzing loop to try to fuzz all these commands. So I did try to fix it uh, to my uh, re responsibility, of course, and I I tried to fix it and I tried to reverse these commands and some of them have been fixed, but remember these commands, not just for turning on and off the, the lights, it also controls the configuration, the main configuration of the lights and the buttons and, and everything you can think about. So this is insane. And well, I try to fix it, and um, yeah, and all of a sudden, 6 a.m., I got this message from my mom um, sending me that, well, I hope you guys have fun the other day because I woke up 6 a.m. because all the lights were turning on at the same time. At this point, uh, we've come to a, um, a small conclusion that, well, the first one is that Barack is not touching, again, the smart home devices. We'll see about that later. But the second one is that, well, we need to install new smart home devices because until we do that, we don't actually have lights and powers and electricity for some things. So, yeah, 
Okay, new smart home device. And I was excited because for me, it's another research to do. They didn't know that yet, but for me, it's a whole nother research. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so the new smart home devices is the HDL automation devices. And by HDL automation devices, I actually mean uh, a company which is called HDL Automation. And this company is a big company, an amazing one, actually. Uh, they, I must say to them, thank you, because they helped me a lot through uh, uh, the disclosure and working with them. And they really consider the security uh, highly in this, uh, in this uh, manners and respect. And also they have more than 10,000 projects around the globe, museums, uh, buildings, hotels, uh, 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 headquarters of some high uh, priority companies and stuff like that uh, using their systems. So even uh, airports, if I didn't say that. So it's really, really interesting to investigate these controllers, right? And they have smart controllers for lights, windows, cameras, a sensor, anything, anything you even didn't think about it. Uh, cool. So we learned about the HDL automation and we've, in, we've installed in our new family home, in our family home, the HDL smart home devices. Let's now see how the HDL smart home works. Sorry. So the HDL smart home system have three basic components. Uh, the first component is the HDL demo relay modules. This is the uh, modules which you can observe just right here. These modules have on the one uh, direction outside this serial, exactly kind of the same serial you've seen in the Philips Dynalite systems uh, with uh, RS-485 uh, connections, uh, which they call BASPO, of course, because, for example, this BASPO is the complete analogy of the Dynet. So this is like the protocols upside on the up of the uh, on the upper side of the uh, uh, of the serial connection. Cool. And this is connected to the IP gateway. This IP gateway uh, is actually kind of the same as I built an IP gateway to adapt between uh, the serial and the IP connection from the serial to the internet, to the entire world. So this is, they have their own smart devices. They have their own unique uh, IP adapter as well. Also Philips have it, but it's, it was really, really expensive. This is why I didn't bought it uh, also in the second time. But in our scenario, uh, my parents thought, okay, it's a good idea. Let's buy all the things. So uh, Barack doesn't even have an idea to start and, and jiggling with this, with these kind of things. Oh boy, they were wrong. And this IP gateway is serial to IP. And the third, the third bullet was the HDL cloud servers. The HDL cloud servers are actually uh, used mainly for remote connections, but not just remote connections. They used to store the configuration for the smart home devices. They used to connect remotely to things because you have routers, you have firewall. So these IP gateways is connected to this HDL core server, cloud servers. And then when you are online on the internet, you can connect to their HDL cloud servers with public uh, IP, uh, public IP interface. So you can reach your devices as well. And now a little bit uh, uh, deeper about how they install it. So first time installation is quite easy and it works like this. You install the HDL Baspo software as a technician. So for example, I'm a technician, I'm coming to your home, I'm installing the HDL Baspo software on my desktop machine and I connect directly with my PC, my technician PC to this IP gateway. It's very cool. And when I'm connected to this IP gateway with my HDL Baspo, I starting to configure all these devices, because remember, these devices are connected serially to this IP gateway. So I connect to this IP gateway and configure all these ones. And I, that's what I say, I configure the bus for adapter and I have a configuration. Now that I have a configuration, I can use this data, this configuration data to uh, upload it, for example, to the cloud, and save it also on my Android app in other apps as well. So what I do next is register a new account in the HDL on application. This is an Android application of HDL automation, and it's used to control remotely and also locally within the Wi-Fi, uh, these smart home devices. And when, as a technician, I register this new account, I also upload the local configuration to the app itself. So now remember, I have a phone in my hand. I register the new account in this application, and I upload the configuration from this IP gateway or from my laptop, uh, from the BASPRO uh, desktop software to this phone. I upload the configuration to my phone. And now the configuration to control everything in my smart home devices 
is inside my phone. So for my phone, I can also connect to the internet. And this is exactly how I back up my configuration in the cloud. So after I have the configuration in my phone, I upload it also to the cloud. And now it's also kept here. Cool. So what happens when a new user comes in and join to our, to our game and wants to also to enter uh, these uh, devices and control them? So what happens next is that uh, he first time he download the HGL on app. Why does that? Because he needs to re log in to the HGL account that has been open to him directly in order to control all these uh, dimmers and other devices. So we download this HGL on app and he log into the HGL account that has been opened by the technician. And what he does next, you can actually bet on that, that, well, yes, he downloads the configuration from the cloud. And when he downloads the configuration from the cloud, he have all the configuration to fully control these devices over here within the Wi-Fi or from remote. So I'm a bit cheating here because there are two possibilities to operate these devices. And we'll talk about it in the next slide, which is the um, remote and the local mode. So we can operate this HDL system in a remote and local connection and the difference between them is that the local connection is accessible from Wi-Fi, uh, usually only from Wi-Fi and local networks. And the remote is uh, accessible from the wide internet and from anywhere inside the world. And usually it makes a real sense that we want to make a remote control connection about it because, well, we want to be able to, uh, for example, I have an air conditioner and I want to control this uh, this air conditioner before I get home because it's really, really hot today and it's a summer. So I would love it to be operated before I get back home, right? Uh, and this is really a cool thing. And at first time installation, the technician actually uh, uh, choose whether to uh, to enable allow, and allow remote connections or not. And usually many times because of the reasons I mentioned, the remote connection is enabled. And this is really interesting. Remember that in any scenario, Remember that in any scenario, um, we are using the HDL cloud servers because in the first scenario of the Wi-Fi local connection, we still back up our configuration for new users to come. And on the remote connection mode, of course, we use these cloud servers to connect back to us. So the third point, the third bullet is always used. The HDL cloud servers are amazing and super interesting. Um, yeah. Internet of Things, uh, now let's add Wi-Fi to uh, all the things and let's see what happens. Um, cool, so the focus of my research. Yes, we can research one and two, uh, but first my family will kill me again if I will destroy all their smart home devices uh, using the connection to the one and two bullets. And the second reason and the most relevant one because I love your family, but it's not that, uh, that uh, uh, exciting and relevant, the, the, re the most relevancy is the hardware. The hardware and the software can be really device dependent. And it's going to take a lot of time to investigate and research any specific device because each device is, has its own capabilities, own serial connection, own things. And to, get, to reach to the point you can really research and find vulnerabilities, it takes much more time and much more time from other things which are publicly known as cloud servers or websites. So of course, uh, I thought that the HDL cloud server, which are a critical bottleneck in these connections, um, are really, really an interesting and a great idea to investigate. And also when you think about a CISO, a CISO view or or a view of, uh, of some people that works for the, uh, to, of the network security and the integrity of the network, uh, you might think that what you need to defend uh, might be, might be, not always, is from the outside, from arbitrary outside, and from the inside, from specific devices. But in this scenario, this cloud server might be okay, might be whitelisted, fully whitelisted, because this cloud server is just connecting to these devices, just connected to your devices, to your certified devices you put in your systems. But you need to understand 
even as someone that works for security, that the bottleneck is can be also outside the organization. And also in the third bullet, in servers that you don't even have the code for them and you don't even know what they're actually kind of doing. So this is really interesting in the point of focus as well. But we speak about focus a lot. Let's now speak about the cloud server. So a starting point for this is the HDL on app, how it works the HDL on app. So first is the login screen, yeah, nice login screen. You can see a simple login here and a sign up button also and the forgot password mechanism, which is really cool. And also interesting, forgot password actually is working the same as you think. It, it sends you a, a, a reset a, a link to your email and you can click on this, uh, on this link and immediately go to this uh, link. But, uh, but the URL, the URL in the forgot password was really, really interesting. And we'll speak about it later. Uh, sign up. Sign up include, you can enter either phone or an email, and you can also add the password. Uh, well, you should add the password. Um, and uh, then you have your all your thing enabled. And after that, you can upload from the app the configuration you have. You remember this IP gateway where I configure all this stuff, so I can upload the configuration from this IP adapter to my phone. And from there on, I can upload this to the cloud. And I can also download uh, cloud configurations using this app to configure my system, my, my application to control these devices in my Wi-Fi network and stuff. Uh, so this is the sign up. Well, enough chit chat. Uh, let's talk about vulnerabilities. So the first vulnerability, really cool, account takeover number one, or let's forget our password together. So. Let's forget our password. I click on the forgot password and I got this following link. Well, this seemed like an, a nice, naive link that doesn't gonna affect anyone, right? Uh, well, the main thing you can see here and observe, I, I will make sure you understand that. Uh, well, there are a couple of parameters, really, really interesting. The first one is the time. Time seems like just the time in, in some format. And email, which is actually my email, the email that I want to reset the password now for, and this parameter and these kind of parameters as well. And this is really, really interesting because uh, you can think that uh, uh, maybe something random should be placed there, right? Something random that I couldn't fake this kind of link. Um, you could also think that if I change this email to any arbitrary email, I it won't work, right? It, it will be verified in some manner and they won't let me change the password for any arbitrary user. Come on. Well, they did. They actually did let me change any user um, uh, password uh, by its email to any user. And the way to exploit it, for example, if I'm thinking otherwise, is to do forget password to my email account, get this link, okay? and change only the email, the email area, to the victim emails. And from there on, I get fully uh, authorization to change its password. This link need to change the password of this user. I can fully change its password, really cool. And it works, perfect. So uh, let's do it again. So account takeover number two, or maybe let's forget our password uh, again. And how can we do, uh, how can we do it? So, Let's forget now about the users I already show you, uh, about the users and the, the forgetting the passwords again. And, and now let's focus about other thing that called the technician user. Uh, the technician user is a user that is automatically generated when the user register with its email. So when the user first time register with an email, for example, a technician install the system and register your HDL account, what is what he's doing is actually also opens up automatically a technician user with the same password as the username, as the original user. For example, I open register with this email at mymail.com. It is automatically also open a technician user at email-debug at mymail.com. And this is really interesting now because the technician user is able to change settings and control all system configuration of the smart home devices as well. And this can be really bad, right? If we can hack this technician user, we can also change the cloud configuration. We can also do many, many more things. Um, 
in these times, I usually uh, ask the, the, the crowd if they know how to act this system. I, I guess some of you actually understand why, where I'm going to, and it's actually really working. So the exploit and to take over any technician user, what you need to do is to find the victim email, let's say victim at mymail.com, and open a new email at this mymail.com service at victim-debug at mymail.com. So I open this new email account and I have it. And yes, what I will do next is just forget my password. I click on forgot password for this victim-debug at mymail.com. And when I do reset password to this account, I will be sending, they will send to me um, their email of link reset, the reset of the password. So I actually can check. change the victim dash debug uh, at gmail.com password. So I actually can get access to all the technician features. I can access the technician user. Um, just to conclude and to make sure everyone is with me, what I'm doing is I'm opening another uh, account for the technician email at victim dash debug at mymail.com and I call the reset password for this uh, email. And, and this is really cool and it's working. And the reason it's working is because they don't verify this email is, not, is they, they don't verify this email is not, a, uh, is not a valid uh, uh, email and they shouldn't send a forget password to this uh, email, to these technician users as, at all, or even find another, another way to put uh, users for the technician, which is not relevant with this dash debug. Um, yes, it really worked and it made me to take over any, any account of, well, technician accounts. Um, very cool. It's working for some mail providers, not all of them. I, I feel in the sense that some of them replacing Dash with, with another. So you can probably be bypassed even in mails that doesn't allow Dash in their username, but I need to think about it even more. Cool. So now we spoke about the pre-authentication vulnerabilities. Let's see what is happening post-authentication. So let's get our devices um, and start investigating some several API mm -hmm. endpoints. And I actually encountered many API endpoints which are open. And some of them were uh, the device by region list. And the device by region list is a very interesting API endpoint. Uh, it comes right after the login, you log in and you have a device list and you can actually search uh, this device list by, um, by the region name, by the region ID, by device ID, by anything you want. So it's really cool. And how you do it, you go to the device section and the parameters to control is the region ID, uh, device ID, device name. So all of these guys are fully controllable and very, very interesting. Um, so the first try I did was sending this. This was in the post data uh, body of the message I've been sending. And this data was uh, uh, containing the parameters need to be searched for. And as you can observe quite well, there is like the SQL injection I try to put. And well, yes, it did return to me all the devices in the system. But remember, to, uh, to find out if there is an SQL injection in the site or not, it's not enough just to test for this kind of screen and to see that I get all the data. I need to do a little bit more than that and to see that it actually does an SQL statement I fully control of black box wise. Cool. And so the second try was something like this. And it actually worked again and I got all the devices. So it's not, and also I, I try to, to make an invalid SQL statement. And what I got is that I get a response, an error response specifically on invalid SQL statements. So yes, I have an SQL injection, very, very cool. I get in all the data, all the data, not in the DB, all the data I have on my devices. So there is some way to gain control and to get all the data of the HGL database. So why not extracting more data, right? Um, well, problems. Some of the problems is that uh, the returned columns and specifically the ASP parser. So the server, uh, as far as I told you, it's the HGL cloud servers. 
uh, they have ASP server inside of them, Windows server, and this ASP parser checks the validity of the return columns. So for example, if I do a union SQL injection, I need to verify and validate that all my data return is correctly to the manner of the ASP parser. And if it's not, I wouldn't be able to pass and get my data. I just get in an error, error response, nothing happens. And well, yes, you might think to yourself, well, just do blind SQL injection, right? That's do like SQL uh, timed SQL injection, something like that. But it's not that that easy because I I am bounded in this scenario by not sending so much data. Well, uh, first thing is that I didn't want to alert the system. I didn't want to bomb the system. I didn't want to stress the, the system or to do anything like that in a sense. And well, and the second thing is that uh, um, even if I do, uh, I will do it, it can take a lot of time because uh, I have more than 11 columns returning from the SQL injection, from, the, from, this, uh, from this SQL query, not the injection, from the SQL query, more than 11 columns, which means almost 4 million queries will be required to inspect all the relevant types and values. Because remember, the ASP parser also checks for the validity even of the ranges of some of the, of the values returned. Uh, yes. And also, if it's worth mentioning that, uh, well, I didn't use VPN. And it's a really good reason not to like jiggle with the site and try to brute force like arbitrary sites. So yeah, um, not a good idea. Don't try it at all. And so this is the blind SQL injection idea. As I told you, even timed or past the error, yes or no, would take a lot of time. Cool. But let's forget about this SQL injection. Let's think about another way to bypass the ASP parser. You all must agree with me that if um, I find another SQL injection that returned must much, much less columns, I could go over all their possibilities with this union SQL injection or something like that and finding out the relevant order to make it work and to return all the data and bypass the ASP parser. So this is exactly what I was going through. So to bypass the ASP parser, I was going to the, the you remember the device name, this is the original parameter for the SQL injection. I tried to find this device name, the exact name, the exact argument in another APIs, another API endpoint. And I actually did find it. I find it in the get room binding device. There is the device name parameter. There is an SQL injection there. Uh, you go to the room section, you search by the device binding name and voila, you have an SQL injection. Very cool, SQL injection in the same argument. And the most amazing thing here is that only four columns are being returned. Only four columns, that's all. And it's really amazing so we can do the permutation over all these options uh, with the possibility to do all of it uh, really really uh, in short amount of queries so uh, permutating over columns order and trying the correct try to make it was doing like this so here you can see the union sql injection and here you can see and observe the uh, the parameters I, I've been put and I just scrambled and printed this one anytime and tried to see if it works and I also increased the number of columns because I didn't really know the number of columns uh, but I knew it was around four uh, I, I say only four I'm sorry it's like it was really around four because I seen that the number of columns was uh, four in the data but it could be maybe one more for the ID or the key saved in the SQL but it was eventually false, so it doesn't really interesting. And I found that this is working. And to conclude all of this, it was quite amazing to see that I'm getting all the database with one single query, one single SQL injection to rule them all, bypassing the ASP parser, um, and getting all the database, uh, all the things as well. Cool. So at this point, of course, I, I, I reached the AGL automation company. Uh, I did fully coordinated disclosure with them, worked with, worked with them uh, silently and helped them a lot. And they also helped me. Um, they were really enthusiastic about helping and, and securing the system. So it was great for them. And But let's now speak about how we can hack into any arbitrary HDL user. For example, you have your own, I don't know, 
HDL account in your smart home in Dubai or you have your own smart home in some airport because there are airports and museum in HDL. So you can actually find a scenario of how you can uh, fully control any, any AGL account. Uh, what we found the, the vulnerabilities we have is two SQL injection and two account takeovers. And there are f two scenarios to gain full takeover over any user. The first scenario, you know the attackers, uh, they, you know the victim's user uh, email. You know the victim's email and you just uh, get from the database uh, the hashed salted password and you now brute force this password. And when you brute force the, this password, you can get after sometimes the password, of course. And the second option is to do one of the takeovers I've mentioned. Actually, the second one, the technician one, is much more silently because when you do account takeover of the, or account takeover over the technician account, usually the normal accounts use the normal people, the, the older people that use uh, normal people in the in the sense of using the system, they use the uh, normal accounts. And they don't use the technician account, only for configuration and when something gets wrong. So you can connect and take over only the, the technician account and it will work silently and no one will know. The second scenario is where you can control any arbitrary HDL user uh, without, uh, without an email. And now we can do it. Uh, for example, you know the company name, you know the phone name of the victim, you know its, its full name in a sense or something like that. So you can scrape through the HDL database and find its account, find its email, and then go back to the first scenario and act this, its, uh, its user by any of these uh, possibilities. Um, okay, really, really cool. So we can hack any AGL user in the entire world. Let's now go through the security implications to conclude what I've been talking about. So let's start with the easy going security implications, not to frighten uh, uh, all the people so much. So the first security implications are the private data leaks, of course, hash passwords, um, emails, phone numbers, company names, names in general tremendous uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, data. And also the HDL Cloud Backup configuration is there, which gives us the following, the full smart devices info. And the full smart devices info is amazing. What you see here, what you can observe here, is exactly from the app. And you can see that this app can control cameras, TVs, security sensors in other manners, and air conditioners also in the server rooms as well. Um, internal network IPs can be exposed using the systems as well, firmware versions. Internal network IPs are because they are written inside of the configuration, some of them, and you can actually use some of them to observe and, and see where are the HDL devices, the IPs, and some of them kind of in the sense. And very cool. And also the remote control. So you can, you can actually, again, of course, remote control over these things, and you can adjust well, as I said before, the air conditioner in the server room, you can make it up to 50 Celsius. Uh, I don't think they actually support it, but 35, something like that for a week would probably destroy the server room, I guess. And also to watch their uh, IP cameras. And uh, so it can be really, really bad. Disable some sensors. Now, uh, I'm sorry for that in advance. This is kind of a pure evil, uh, uh, pure evil ideas, uh, but we need to discuss them because we need to, to understand and realize that the security implications, even if I don't have a full RC over any kind of device, that, that there are tremendous uh, and high impact and costly impacts over the organizations as well that can be done. And the first one is, well, you can add internal non-exposed IPSGL gateways. Sometimes they are hiding the gateways that controls other system. For example, hidden security areas, hidden secure rooms and stuff like that. You can actually expose them because there is an auto search functionality in the app. Another thing you can do is you can do, uh, you can encrypt all the configurations, remove all the configuration from the, from the HDL app. And some people can do kind of a ransomware and blackmail the companies and until they won't do it, you won't give them back their 
possibility to control their system, to control their lights, to control their, their powers, their ACs. This can really shut down a company in the, in the logistics, in the industri industry manner, uh, log logistics manner a lot. Another thing is to use a, a conditioner to affect critical locations. Um, and also uh, something I really love, uh, which is called an hidden trigger attack. What is an hidden trigger attack? So let's, for example, say that we are not in the Wi-Fi. We are not in a local connection. Okay, you are smart guys. You block all the remote connections. You keep only the local connections. But remember, the configuration is still on on the HDL cloud servers. So when the user will update, and it will update its configuration sometimes, you can actually connect the button, this, for example, switch on the lights to the button that's also uh, switch and adjust the air conditioner to 35 degrees, 35 Celsius degrees. So you can connect two buttons, for example, to the same button. So the user thinks he just opened up the light, but he actually did a lot of other stuff as well. Disabled sensors and did a lot of other things. And for this attack, you don't even need the remote mode connection, even in the local mode, it can be really affect the users in the organization because the configuration is still on the HDL cloud backup uh, database. The HDL cloud servers are really affecting the organization as a bottleneck. Also, another thing you can do, you can disable and control other critical sensors, of course. You can disable security cameras, you can disable sensor for overeating, security alerts, security alerts, sorry, um, mm -hmm. and also you name it. Um, well, this is another idea. This is not a direct security uh, issue, but this is another idea I, I had in mind, which is exploiting the internal network. Uh, for example, I can change a cloud configuration file to a malicious one, maybe something that does something on the device. Maybe I can exploit the device when they update the configuration mm -hmm. file on the device. It can be really interesting. It can be ideas for further research and stuff like that. So this is really cool, and it increases the attack surface to the internal network and to the organization as well. Uh, cool, so we are coming to conclusion and some of the ideas to continue is of course to find a way from the account takeover uh, to get in, uh, into the internal network of the organization. Can it be done? How it can be done? Uh, taking over the device, taking over something like something else, maybe taking advantage of the way they control the smart home devices in the network. I don't know, you name it. And another thing is um, to access from the LAN and the Wi-Fi access. For example, I have already a Wi-Fi and LAN access. How to, do, to find an RC over one of the uh, smart devices platform, specifically, of course, the IP uh, adapter, the IP serial adapter of the HDL uh, gateway devices, which is really cool also. And yes, so many amazing ideas can be done. Um, it can be amazing, amazing. I had so much fun uh, working for this project. And I come really to conclusion. I want to thank uh, anyone, uh, starting from the AGL automation company, uh, for fast fix and coordinated disclosure of all the vulnerabilities. AGL automation, you are really great, and I loved working with you guys. Um, the second thing is that I wanted to uh, really uh, thank uh, Ofer Peleg, uh, which is the AGL Israel representative, for supporting me along the way and helping me fix the issues. Also, uh, amazing guy. And, uh, well, of course, uh, thank you to my family for letting me break in their house, uh, but only one time, only one time, hopefully not on the second time, but we will see about that. And of course, and of course, I'm really thankful for uh, Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1, thank you for sponsoring and supporting my research. Uh, thank you so much. And... Well, I think that is it. We are coming to reach to a live Q questions and answers. So if you want to, uh, if you have any questions uh, to my, uh, about my lecture, or if you re want to read my full blog. So first, uh, I wanted to know that my full blog and my full research will be published right now as we speak in the Sentinel Labs blog. So make sure you follow uh, Sentinel Labs and go to the Sentinel Labs website in Sentinel One. And there is my full research with a lot of other uh, code sections and stuff.